This episode of Tech Zilla is sponsored by the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, the United States Air Force, and GoDaddy.com. Coming up on this episode, Dual Boot XP and Vista. It is so easy. You ask, we have a review of the Popcorn Hour A100 media player, a Zoom giveaway. Remember from last week, you've got a few more days to enter the drawing, and Veronica's got the details. So pull out the tea bags, boil some water, and take a load off, because Texilla starts now. You said tea bag. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> I did. And in a non gaming reference for a change. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. A proper reference. Welcome to Techzilla. I should point out, I'm your host, Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. AKA Tea Bag 101. We have a great show lined up for you today <laughs> Mother's Day. Mother's Day happened. Did you get your tech on for Mother's Day? Well, I ordered my mom flowers from 1800flowers.com. So that's kind of techie, right? <laughs> that's about the the best she's going to get for that. I had, I had technology issues. There's actually almost no tech involved in my mother's day. Oh, really? It was analog. There was sunshine involved, outdoorsy. Wow. It was exciting. Outdoorsy. You should go, the, the, it was, it was sunny. It, it was nice out, if I recall. I don't think I really, oh no, I went outside on Sunday for a little bit. For a little bit. And all that vitamin D and like <laughs> glare, it really kind of <laughs> You went out, freaks, you got your pizza, me. and you went back to your apartment. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, if you've been following my Twitter account, you know that I had a stage four baby drool assault, which took out the keyboard of my iPhone on Friday. Wait, what happened? He, you know how I, I drilled out my iPhone so you can put a regular headphone jack in it? No. What I found? I haven't seen this at all. What are you talking about? You haven't about? seen this. Basically, there's. No. A, I, I modded my iPhone, and anyhow, the, the the baby was has been teething, right? So mm -hmm. he's in the office with me, and he grabs the iPhone and he starts teething on it. So I figure it's it's you know pretty well sealed. Nom nom nom. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And literally, like by the time he was done, there was drool coming out of the, the you know the little oh. hole for the for the the earpiece oh. so the bottom half of my keyboard's not working so anyhow basically Babies took out the keyboard of my iphone they're not disgusting Ugh. they're fun wonderful little creatures Blech. i wish you seven it'll be fun <laughs> <laughs> anyhow i want to thank everybody that sent out ideas for drying it out so like putting it in a ziploc bag with uh, rice or salt or the little silicon oh, gel bags it will absorb it because it wants the silicon gel bags yeah those prevent moisture from getting into other stuff i, have, I used to save those just for these kind of emergencies and, and my stash is gone so i use the rice method actually here it is uh drying out on the hp blackboard blackboard the hp blackbird in my cube because the heat comes out mm -hmm. of the top of that I actually helped get about half the keyboard running. Um, the festival of rice and salt came later. I've dried out radios in an oven set to 200 degrees with the radio case opened up and you basically lift it off of a cookie sheet with some wooden blocks. That actually works pretty well. The trick is to not turn it up so high you melt plastic. Yeah. So it's really embarrassing if you like melt a whole bunch of components into the PCB. That would be a nice um, little art piece though. That's true actually. Melted iPhone on top of... <laughs> It's even better than one of those clocks. So <laughs> anyhow, about half the touch screen on the iPhone is still dead. If you're up for seeing us do an iPhone rebuild and refurbish, basically yanking it open, replacing some parts on uh, System or Texilla, let me know. You can make a Franken phone. That's a thought. I actually had one that I made out of a, a long time ago, actually, out of an old uh, oh, Motorola. What were those horrible phones, the clamshell phones they had forever? The, the StarTac uh, phones. Oh. It was hmm. like a week old and it cracked and it pinched me, so I turned it, I basically mounted it on a stick. And people said that they couldn't domesticate Patrick Norton. I'm very domesticated. Next you're going to be baking us cookies. I do bake cookies. Making a three layer cake. That I'm not really into. Yeah. But I, I, pretty good with a paella pan. But we should remind you guys about our Zune giveaway, where we're giving away a Zune, a set of premium Zune headphones, mm -hmm. and a, also a Zune card that you can get like 10 free songs with. Uh, this Fabu giveaway ends next Monday, the 19th, 12 midnight Pacific time. Mm -hmm. So get in your video questions. We want to see your video question. Upload it to YouTube. Make sure it's no more than 15 seconds in length. That is 15. That is 1-5. And send us an email with the link. I'm very... That's not 45 it's, seconds. Yeah. That's not 90 seconds. That's 15 seconds. Right. And then put Zoom contest in the subject line. And unfortunately, the giveaway is only open to U.S. residents ages 18 and up. So That's legalese. It's not our fault. Right. We would prefer That's everyone standard. everywhere to be in there, but the lawyers basically pointed guns at us. Because yeah. lawyers are like that. They frighten me. They should. Anyhow, so should we get to some emails? <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. First question is a video question that comes from Edward. Hi, Patrick and Veronica. I'm interested in the best point-and-shoot camera to record video for YouTube. Thanks. 
So Edward wants to know what the best point and shoot camera is for uploading videos to YouTube. Oh, it's YouTube. You can use anything. Buy a $99 camera that records the flash memory well, yeah, pretty from behind much the counter at, you know, Any point and shoot Walgreens. camera that has a, a video capture setting, right. you can pretty much just drag the, the files over to your computer, upload them to YouTube, and it's fine. However, uh -oh. there are cameras that have special YouTube settings for recording that will optimize it for YouTube. Like the, uh, off and automatically make it look all crunchy and flash -tastic. No, but you know what I mean. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's got the right the size and compression rate and everything. And That's the Casio cool. Exilim does that. Their whole new line hmm. is basically you just put it on the YouTube capture setting, take your video, and then when you plug in your camera, you have the option to just type in the name and description, and then it just uploads it right to YouTube. Now, you're a big fan of the, the Exilim cameras also, right? That is the Exilim camera. That's what I, I just said. Way to go. Do you mean the Zacties? That's the one. Yes, the Zacties are pretty good. I mean, those are video cameras by right. nature that just also happen to take photographs. Right. So it's kind of like the reverse of that, but they're way more expensive. I mean, the HD version, the A1000, right. runs about $1,000. And they actually do a, a, a shockingly good job. And the form factor is a little strange for sometimes to get used to because yeah, that sort of like gun like it's not, shape. It's not that comfortable. There is one thing worth pointing out though. Like half of the most popular. Uh, if you start looking at like the stuff that's not pirated and half of the homemade videos that are up on YouTube, like the most popular videos, it seems like half of them were done with a cheap net cam mm -hmm. that's, that's barely 320 by 240 on a good day. And a lot of them were done with, you know, what would now be considered bottom of the line mini DV standard def camcorders. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. But you can also get that um, Amazon sells the flip camera mm -hmm. and that's just a little, it's made for YouTube basically. Right. And it does really crappy video. It's not that but crappy. But it's 129 bucks and yeah. it's not that crappy. I, I picked one up, I, I, I picked up a year old, a year ago I picked up uh, a couple of those and it's actually, if you keep it, if it's brightly lit mm -hmm. and you know, you, you don't try to follow a soccer game with it, it actually does a pretty good job. Well, there's a lot of options for you, but now it's time for a message from the United States Air Force. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. Today's selection is Google Earth. Now, now, hold on. It's actually, there's some fresh stuff going on here. I mean, it's like a giant, fat, virtual globe. Google Earth provides users with a satellite's eye view of the little blue marble we like to call the Earth. And it does the moon and a few other things, right? Now, if you're familiar with Google Maps, the operation of Google Earth is very similar, except it works in 3D. Simply type in the address or the latitude and longitude of where you want to go on Google Earth and you'll be whisked away to your destination. It's like flying. Now this being a Google product, you'll be able to overlay some pretty cool stuff like Google Maps data, including points of interest, road, traffic, weather, terrain, and of course streets. But you can also see things like submitted YouTube videos from locations in that area, historical and sightseeing information, picks from sources like Gigapixel and Gigapan, and if that isn't enough, any relevant Google Earth community posts for that location. So if you have a hankering to check out what the world looks like on the other side of the globe, whether for research or fun, and you haven't checked it out in a while, definitely give Google Earth a spin. All right, I think it's time for some more questions. We got an email from Steven about XP and Vista. He writes in, I'm building a quad core gaming rig. I wanted to run Ooh. Vista, 32-bit version, along with Windows XP, and I've got a pair of 150 gigabyte Raptors. That's really awesome. So they have plenty of room for games. What's the best way to do this? Should I load one operating system on each drive, or should I go with a slower, larger drive and just partition it out? Steven, that's a great question. Hmm. So would you just install one OS, I, wait, both OS's on one, or? I'd probably install both OS's on one, mm -hmm. right, because it's actually pretty easy to do. Basically, I'd put both OS's on one drive and put the games on the other, or use the second drive as a storage drive for data and stuff. I just don't see a lot of advantage to putting each OS on a separate drive beyond not having to create a partition for the second operating system, or operating system, as most people say it here in the US, on, a, on like one drive. Mm -hmm. So APC has something really cool. It's the Australian Personal Computer Magazine. They have an excellent set of step-by-step -step guides for dual booting XP and Vista. One if you install XP first, one if you install Vista first, which is a little different process, and one for Linux, Vista, and XP. Because basically each one, whichever operating system you install last, tends to take over the master boot record and try to control the machine. 
Hmm. So all of them actually take advantage of netsmart.net. This is a really cool site. They make free software. They're very excellent and very free, easy BCD, and it can boot you into just about any operating system. And it's not going to make you claw your eyes out like Vista's bcedit.exe command line interface, which is painful. Now, when you're selling Vista, something you should know, if you're selling Vista on top of XP, it automatically offers XP. If you install, if you don't override it, if you install it in a separate partition, Vista automatically will offer the bootloader with XP as an earlier version of Windows. Now, if you're doing this to a drive you're quite happy with right now, do us a favor, clone it, or at least back up your data before installing a second operating system. Now, if you're gonna do this out of Vista, you can actually use Vista to resize the partition of XP. Boot from the Vista DVD, select Install Now, and when you get to the product key page, hit Shift F10. That'll launch the Windows PE command window. Type in list volume, type in select volume zero, basically you want your XP volume, and type in shrink. And then Vista's gonna reduce the size of the XP volume by 50%. When it's done, hit exit, and you'll be back to the Vista installation window. Now, you want more exact control over the partition resizing? Gparted is a free boot disk ISO for resizing partitions. It's based on Linux, and it's awesome. So. Once you have your partition resized, you just install Vista. Vista's bootloader takes over booting, and you can now load XP through the Vista bootloader. XP, we said it before, it's the earlier version of Windows, listed as the Windows Boot Manager when you start. If you want to change that name or remove Vista's bootloader, launch EasyBCD. Pretty slick, pretty easy, and it's basically like three clicks, and you've made your changes. That was a lot of stuff. <laughs> You're going to be like, why don't you just use Boot Camp? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually having problems on my Mac right now. I can't figure out. Are you running Boot Camp? I know I'm not uh, running Boot Camp. I actually have not been able to install Boot Camp even using Ooh. the uh, Boot Camp Setup Assistant. That's a little I don't know why, but my problem is totally unrelated, and I'm going to ask the viewers, and I know this is completely off topic, and I just thought of it right now. Okay. But you guys are smarter than we are most of the time. So you a can lot help more me. Of you. <laughs> so I've been using Time Machine on my Mac, and I have an external, a 500 gigabyte external drive that mm -hmm. I've been saving everything to, which I also use as storage for other things. Okay. Suddenly it went from having like 250 gigs of space on it. To like two? Basically, yeah, to like, <laughs> to like 10. And over the course of a couple weeks. That, that whole and I've been running, time I've been machine. running Time Machine for a really long time, and it's never done that before. And I don't know what happened or what it's remembering or what I should tell it not to copy over. Interesting. But I don't know where all this data suddenly came from. I don't know how to figure that out. Because I've never fiddled file. around with Time Machine very much. Did you bring the drive in? I could bring it in next week, bring yeah. All right, we'll take that. a look at it. Or if you guys have experienced that problem, problem before, maybe Email you can us. help me too. Email us. Techzilla at revision3.com. Yes. And so before we move on, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration would like to remind you about their Click It or Ticket campaign. Click It or Ticket will focus on aggressive seatbelt enforcement mobilization between May 19th and June 1st, 2008 across the country. A few facts about seatbelt use. 59% of those killed in an auto accident were not wearing seatbelts at the time of the crash. The greatest risk for dying in a motor vehicle crash is at night. In 2005, over 15,000 passenger vehicle occupants died in traffic crashes between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So unless you want to risk a ticket or worse, your life, remember to click it or ticket day and night. From coast to coast, cops are cracking down on seatbelt violations. Buckle up day and night or expect a ticket. Click it or dig it. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick is the Internet Archive at archive.org. The purpose of the archive is to be a permanent home for online media so that researchers, students, and historians can access the information for years to come. It's a great nonprofit library that's been around since 1996, and it collects audio, video, tech, software, and even archived web pages. So before you start complaining that this sounds an awful lot like school, there's tons of amazing media that you can view and download, much of which is available under licenses that allow you to remix and share the material. Now, we've shown you the Wayback Machine before, but my favorite uses for archive.org aren't related to websites. It's all about the downloadable and embeddable content for me. Whether it's World War II newsreels at the Perlinger Archives, old radio broadcasts, or just getting gameplay footage for your upcoming feature-length Machinima epic, you'll find tons of vintage and contemporary media to get your sticky little fingers on. It's also great for finding sound clips and music for your podcast. One of the most tedious things about making a podcast is finding sound elements that won't make someone eventually try to sue you for infringement. And as a bonus, you can upload your podcast to the archive for free hosting. 
In fact, I use a free app called Spin Express 2 to upload my podcast, well, not the one you're watching, of course, and you can add all the metadata from within the app. The Internet Archive is a bounty waiting to be pillaged for your education and enjoyment. Veronica, brace yourself. We have more questions. <gasps> All right, what we have a, a question from Toby in the far off frozen tundra of Sweden. He writes, hi, I have a small problem with a setup on my computer. The thing is, is that it's a small TV studio where I'm trying to do my own school broadcast. Aww. Aww. The school owns a teleprompter, but to use it, I would need another guy. And for the camera, another guy. And for, well, you catch my idea. So the teleprompter is reflecting the computer screen. It shows up mirrored. And my problem is, how do I flip it back? Not rotate, just flip it back. Toby from Sweden. All right, Toby, to answer your question, we figured we'd have one of your own country people answer for us. Welcome now to Techzilla, our beloved Swedish intern, Camilla. Bork, bork, bork. Bork, bork, bork. Thank you so much. So yes, I am Camilla Stenmark, the Swedish, Swedish intern. And I'm going to try to explain to you as good as I can. So Torbjörn, nu ska jag lära dig allt jag kan. Steg nummer ett, använd en till spegel. Den kan spegla tillbaka texten rätt, men det krävs vissa snickaregenskaper. Så om du inte vill leka byggjobbare så finns det ett andra alternativ. Om du använder Windows kan du kontrollera om ditt grafikkort kan vända skärmbilden. Högerklicka på skrivbordet och välj egenskaper, sedan inställningar och avancerat. Beroende på ditt grafikkort kan du ha möjligheten att invertera, vända om texten på skärmen eller inte. Det är den lättaste vägen. Om det inte fungerar så har vi en annan lösning för dig. Det går att använda ett teleprompterprogram. En bra variant är Prompt! Den finns i en gratisversion. Den kallas då Prompt Light. Gratisversionen är jämfört med Prompt givetvis lite begränsad vad det gäller funktioner. Till exempel så ger den dig inte möjlighet att prompta filer mer än 2500 tecken. Hoppas att det här hjälper dig i Prompterdjungeln. And for the rest of you, Patrick and Veronica, help them out! I didn't hear a single bark. I don't know. It can't be Swedish. No, Maybe we've been Finnish. misinformed. Actually, Finnish sounds like gargling rocks, but I say that. Don't with... offend our Finnish viewers. Have you ever heard Finnish? He's awful, isn't I he? I know. I All right, well, let's guys... do the translation. Yeah, we'll do the translation. So here we go. Simple way is to use another mirror to reflect the text back the right way around, but it requires building or woodworking skills. Mm -hmm. Check in the display settings of your video card in Windows, right click on desktop and hit properties. Depending on your video card, you may or may not have an option to invert or reverse a display. Another solution is to use a different teleprompter program. A pretty decent one is Prompt! They have a free version called Prompt Light. It has a few less features than regular prompt and shorter word count. So you can't put in a huge amount of text compared with the pay version. That was fun. Prompt. It's like <laughs> Yahoo! <laughs> Yahoo! Yahoo! Next up. Nick writes in, any chance for a product review on the Popcorn Hour Streaming? Yeah. Okay, the network media, <laughs> media thing, streamer. the Popcorn Hour A100, the A100, there's like 42 names for this thing. And I gotta say, you guys love your media streamers, especially if they have BitTorrent clients built in. So this is the Popcorn Hour A100. It's pretty much the only one you've asked for a review on that is actually shipping, albeit in tiny amounts and only when they're available. We're still working on getting on the iStar H, or getting in the iStar HD, the Mica, and the very slick look. ZV. Ooh, the ZV looks cool, huh? It looks really cool. It looks really expensive and really complicated, and they've mm -hmm. invented local net broadcasting technology, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. makes me go, hmm. And I'm sure somebody's going to ask for a Tivix box review now that we've talked about this. So, 180 bucks for the box. The Popcorn Hour is essentially a set-top box with space for a hard drive and an Ethernet jack on the back. It does streaming video, audio, photos. Uh, we should point out there's no hard drive included in that price. So no. you're looking at the back of it right now. So we got HDMI, composite, S-video, and and uh, a 10100 Ethernet connection. No Wi-Fi? No oh. Wi-Fi. Okay. No Wi-Fi at all. That is kind of lame. They just didn't want to deal with Wi-Fi, or they didn't want to deal with the development of the Wi-Fi on the board. But the whole point of, of home theater is is going Wi-Fi, to me anyway. Like, wireless is the way to go. Well, you've also future. got that whole Mac thing. I, on one hand, wireless is the future, but on the other hand, you know, I think part of what they're saying is, is just fewer problems with dealing with streaming over uh, a hardwired connection. And it's going to your yeah, home I theater suppose. system, so it's probably a whole ton of cabling there anyway. But you can see basically it's an ATA hard drive. And uh, this is built around the Sigma SMB8635 chipset, which has a ton of horsepower for 1080p, MPEG-2, DivX, all in high def. So it's a pretty interesting concept. The Basically, 90% of this thing is right here, and the rest of it is space for additional cables and the hard drive on that. And it does all sorts of fancy Web 2.0 stuff, like 
like RSS feeds and the YouTube. I think RSS feeds predate the Web 2.0. I'm 2. just joking. That was that was a funny joke. And that okay. was a funny joke? It was a funny, you funny joke. Break in the humor. <laughs> Is that what we're calling it now? Uh, oh, oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> Fortunately, I've removed the cable cutters of doom away from you. So, okay. <laughs> So they've got actually, we're not going to go into the sort of torrent stuff there, but the media service portal. Now I reset this and reloaded the firmware this morning. So you notice something right now, it tends to take its time when it's doing things. This is normal. They've been releasing fairly regular firmware updates for this, and I keep waiting for the one that's going to make everything fast. And you know what? There we go. Uh, oh, good. Oh, look at that. So we got the YouTube, the Flickr, the Vio, the Blip TV, Picasa. Hey, let's go to Revision 3. That is cool looking. It is pretty slick, actually. Now, it's basically, because uh, I reset the firmware, it's kind of reloading everything. Um, it is not the fastest puppy on the planet. Yeah, I noticed. Um, it's pretty, you know, we're kind of loading some stuff here. Oh, but ooh, there we are. There we go, Techzilla. And what it's going to do here is it's going to actually stream the Flash version on this. Do not mistake the video quality on this while you're looking at the Flash. This is a Flash issue. This has nothing to do uh, with the actual quality of uh, the video that could come out of the A100. The time, however, or the sort of click to clunk lag on everything is pretty normal. Um, this is definitely, which point, I, I, in a lot of ways, I really like this. The video quality actually can be super impressive. Um, but it's definitely an early adopter kind of toy. If you have like a bazillion uh, gigabytes of downloaded stuff that you want to be able to play back or you live for the streaming media. Oh, that's so cute. Look, Why the is flash it so is tiny? Centered. Well, because it's basically doing the flash in the native resolution in a 1080p monitor. Okay. Now, what I could do is actually go back into the menuing system and change the output and it should automatically readjust that. Or we can take a moment here to go to our menu and that should give us the happy, whoops. And back to the main menu. Home. Oh, this thing is slow. It would drive me insane. Oh it, my god. It, it it's does take me a it, headache just watching it now. It's kind of at its best when you're playing longer movie clips. <sighs> All right. Um, this one's actually not going to stretch. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you've are you're basically latched on to the primary annoyance on this. Um, let me go back to the home menu here and we'll go into the settings really quickly. Uh, the BitTorrent works. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time with it because I'm, I'm not a BitTorrent maven these days because mm -hmm. I got the cable at home. But let's go into the setup and there's basically a ton of features inside of this, most of which have been implemented, but you know, you've pretty much picked on the frustrating, incredibly slow part. So I'm going to go back to the automatic setting on this, auto, and HDMI output on the audio, and hopefully that'll play a little bit more happily. And let me switch this around real quick. But USB input works off of hard drives, it works off of memory sticks, and you saw the web services going there. So networkmediatank.com, the forums will definitely help you sort things out, because there's the documentation, like with most sort of Asian sourced 32,001 media boxes, the, the documentation is pretty weak. Networkmediatank.com um, has pretty good forums, plus the My iHome server software, which allows you to stream. You're, 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 like, you're like so horrified by the speed on this. It's awful. It's, fr it's definitely frustrating. I, I will not fight you on that one. And in case you're wondering why there's no audio, it's because somebody pulled off the speakers off of our HD panel. Um, so, so, there we go. This is 1080p. This is actually... Form over function, right? Form over function. This is a 1080p trailer that we, that we pulled down off of the QuickTime trailer site. Would you say that's pretty satisfactory video it's playback? It's pretty decent playback. So, yeah. uh, a lot of people use this for actually uh, ripped Blu-ray and AC DVD movies, um, DivX collections, and DVD collections streaming off of them. It won't play an ISO disc, but it will play uh, like an ISO of a DVD, but it will play most other things. Um, I gotta say, Apple TV is still my standard of excellence to compete against for uh, uh, media extension type boxes. I like it. I've been using it more and more frequently. The now. Apple TV, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely it's it's kind of like uh, you know I, I I can hear the sort of anti Apple uh, shouts from certain corners, but it's simple, it's easy, and it's easy to set up. This all in one, uh, this is an all in one device. The the A100, the popcorn hour A100 doesn't need necessarily need a PC. It will stream from your local servers. It'll play off of USB drives. It's more of an enthusiast toy for somebody that's looking for amazing audio quality, reasonable, or I should say amazing video quality, reasonable audio quality, not a great audio player, fine for home theater, surround sound and stuff. Um, but it's definitely, you need patience. Hmm. Veronica does not have the patient face on. I think we might get rid of our Series 3 and go with Media Center. Really? Yeah. 
thinking about it. That's kind of tempting. Media it's Center big, PCs kind of rock. Yeah. I, I got to say, I've been using the, the Media Center and XP and Vista for a long time, mm -hmm. and they're pretty solid. Well, I digress. <laughs> All right, so uh, before we go on, stop. It's time to uh, take a minute for the sponsors who make this episode all possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank the fine people at GoDaddy.com. We want to remind our viewers to tune in to the Indy 500 broadcast presented by GoDaddy.com. Danica Patrick already made history on the track when she won the Indy Japan 300. Now she's ready to do it again and take the checkered flag in Indianapolis. Be sure to catch all the high-speed action May 25th, courtesy of GoDaddy.com. And remember, they help us bring the show to you. So if you want to make an impact online, do us a favor and do it with GoDaddy.com. They got .com names as low as $1.99, world-class hosting, fast and easy website builders, and quite a bit more. Now, if you enter in the code TECH3, that's T-E-K-3 when you check out, and you get to register domain names for $6.95. Some restrictions are going to apply. See the site for details. Do us a favor and get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com. Are you done fiddling with the things? You ready to answer some more? Hey! Stop it. Look! That's our high def video. Looks Ooh, a lot better, doesn't it? It does. It even looks better when it's playing. All right, so are you ready to answer some more questions now? I'm absolutely ready to answer more questions. Captain Smurfly ready? We got video questions. Oh, yes. I think it's time to take one of our video questions, which I'm very excited about. Nathan from Sydney oh, has a question about microphones for Nathan video podcasting. From Sydney. We'll let him explain. Hi, guys. I wanted to ask you what would be a good wireless microphone system that I could use in a video podcast where it wouldn't be extremely obvious that I'm actually wearing a microphone? Um, so if you guys could give a recommendation, that'd be awesome. Thanks. <sighs> Nathan, he's so dreamy. Do you rather have Nathan or chocolate? It's a chocolate. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. Anyhow, um, wow. yeah, there are a lot of great microphones to choose from. It sounds like you're looking for like a lavalier type of thing, the kind that like we've got clipped on here. Wirelessmicrophones.com, they have a pretty good selection, and even if you don't buy from them, it's a great way to see what's available. If you want to be really inconspicuous with the mic instead of using a clip like the one we have, get a little vampire clip. It uses tiny pins that kind of hook on the inside of your shirt. And they hurt like hell when somebody if stabs you, them into your If you your stick skin. your finger with it or if they actually jab it into your skin, it hurts like I won't go there. Heck. It hurts a lot. H-E double hockey sticks? H-E double hockey sticks. Yes. Uh, yeah. So if you need a mic and a win uh, wireless receiver, it'll run you anywhere from $100 to $1,000. To several thousand dollars. To several thousand dollars, depending on the level of sound quality and the uh, distance range that you're going for, the wireless range. I got to say, wireless mics tend to be expensive, and if you don't spend a lot of money on them, they tend to work poorly, uh, especially if you have a lot of electrical devices in your room. If you're not wandering mm, around the room, yeah. If you're not like all over the place, like a rock star on a stage, just get a decent mic, a lavalier mic, like mm -hmm. you mentioned. Get a lavalier mic, hardwire it to your camera or PC, whatever you're recording with. Wireless is useless and expensive if you're not roaming around. It's just True. it's just so much easier to get perfect sound out of a hardwired mic. His audio on his money. video didn't really sound that bad either. Well, some people are hypercritical. They want nothing but the best. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then there's Texilla. I mock because I'm cruel. Veronica is rather broken up over Nathan or the was, is that really caffeinated chocolate? It is caffeinated chocolate. Is that what you were? Oh, man. <laughs> I've had a lot of it. <laughs> You're going to crash before you make it to the gym. Veronica is going to get over Nathan, and we're going to get you right on to the next video email, which comes from Derek. Hey, guys. Uh, just curious if there were any 1080i standalone Divix players that y'all would recommend. All right. Sounds like Derek definitely wants a recommendation for a 1080i Divix player. Which uh, we should point out that a 1080i DivX, but first of all, you're, it's probably going to be a 1080p at this point because mm. 1080i at the max for, for so players. Wait, does he want like a set top box? Is that what he's going for? I think he could basically would this use work? it. this uh, work? This would actually work. There's, there's a bunch of boxes out there that are actually, the, the TIVX would be one of them. The Popcorn Hour would play DivX. Um, should play DivX. I'll have to check. Roger Chang uh, is our resident DivX fiend, and he's had really good luck using an Xbox 360. Low bit rate DivX files are going to look pretty rough, though, when you scale them up to 1080p. Not the best he's ever seen, but certainly good enough to watch an hour video of, for example, certain English sci-fi series that aren't available in the U.S. and involve a TARDIS. Correct, Roger? Yes, that's more of a DivX issue, though, than a player issue. Now, Oppo, the DVD, the upscaling DVD company, they make excellent upscaling DVD players that go all the way to 1080p. It's like 11. And they have USB 2.0 ports, which is great because then you can sneaker net your DivX files to the DVD player on your TV, or you can burn them to a disc. There are also a ton of 
kind of cheap DVD players that play DivX discs in these kind of $100 range that are going to require you to burn it to a disc, or not so cheap, usually more expensive than the Oppo uh, players, that are network DVD players. Literally, it either has an 802.11G or an Ethernet adapter on the back or both, usually from companies you've never heard of that can stream files over your network from your media server. Those are getting pretty common. Most of them are starting to do 720p or 1080p, and of course, there are boxes like the popcorn that we showed earlier. What is sneaker net? Oh, sneaker net is when you have the, the basically, if I take this mm -hmm. and I walk over to a computer, instead of using it on a network, that's sneaker net. So you have to <laughs> jog in place for, for a period of time? No, no, if I walk a file from one computer to another, see, this is a file walking. <laughs> with really big files, we, I mean, we've actually found if you're, you're working with like 10, 15 gigabyte files, a lot of times it's faster to copy it to a hard drive and walk it down the hallway rather mm. than transferring it over the network. If I run in place, I'll bounce and it'll look hideous and I'm just not ready for that, Roger. You're too cruel. There'll be no bouncing. <laughs> Think Baywatch, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's just it's just not going to work. <laughs> the idea is to keep people coming back to the show. All right. Well, for all you people watching, we live on your questions, so email us at techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how tos. You ask us, we'll do it. But we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them in to techzilla at revision3.com. And as always, you can visit our forums, revision3.com slash forum. That's so easy. Plus, previous episodes of Techzilla are waiting patiently for you to show up and watch them at revision3.com slash techzilla. You can find out more details on the site. Thank you for watching. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla and Veronica's going into a chocolate caffeine coma. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. <laughs> Bye. Dude, you <laughs> the Popcorn Hour A100, which is this wee beastie right here, is the only one that you've asked for a review on that we could actually, mm. and let me actually pull the cables up here. That's oh, ah, okay, it's just a 10 year old receiver. It's just, <laughs> don't worry about it. Let's go back to the top on that. <laughs> yes, uh, well the camera's not on me. Okay, thank you. The camera's not on me. The camera's not on me. I can't work under these me. conditions. You people. I love you, Roger. <laughs>